So I think I'd like to, greetings everybody, by the way. I think I'd like to start off with a quote this morning. Meta took a trip to India last year and we visited the Gandhi Research Foundation and a number of other things. And at the end of the trip, uh, the two of us went to an ashram in Kerala state called Anand Ashram, which was the uh, spiritual institution started by Swami Ramdas. Uh, one of whose quotes you have in the worksheet for the first session. And we met there a man named Swami Muktananda that I, I don't know if you can say that you really like a Swami, but I just like this guy. He was such a, he was just such a great guy. Uh, like for example, the minute I walked in, the room was full of people more than we are here. And he was speaking in Malayalam and the minute he saw me walk in, uh, he said to everybody, are we okay with English? And switched over to English. So anyway, he's a wonderful person. And he wrote the final essay last year one time in their magazine, The Vision. And so I was reading it with eagerness to see what he would say. And he said something that's very pertinent to what we were trying to cover last week, which is what kind of thing is nonviolence? Where do we look for it? And how should we expect to see its results? Which is a critical question because the results of nonviolence are happening all the time and people do not, put, do not connect the dots, do not see. And on the other hand, they see failure over and over again with violence and they fail to recognize it. And we were talking about that cover of The Economist. Last time we said back to Iraq and then the subhead was getting it right this time. As though, you know, something which has failed for a thousand years, maybe just the next time it'll work. So anyway, on the brighter side, he said, spirituality in its true sense is to be aware of the binding force which envelops all creatures. Isn't that wonderful? And what he said about spirituality is exactly what we're trying to say about nonviolence, that there is a binding force that envelops all creatures. And once we become aware of it and start living in accordance with it, we are developing our spirituality and we're also generating the capacity to be nonviolent. And in, often when asked what is nonviolence, I say nonviolence is the bridge between spiritual development and social change. Because if you are, if you have a spiritual practice, you come to want to be active in the world, it's got to be through nonviolence. Otherwise, you will be betraying what you gained in your practice and you won't gain anything in the outside world either. So I wanted to also draw your attention to this little book that I picked up at a meeting of peace workers during the week by Richard Dietz called Active Nonviolence Across the World. This is actually uh, what they would call in German, ein Sonderdruck. It's a, aus a take out and print out version of his famous essay, which was called The Global Spread of Active Nonviolence. So Dietz and Walter Wink got together enough statistics for them to say that uh, slightly more than half the world has experienced a major nonviolent episode or campaign I think in the last 25 years, something like that. And that was before Arab Spring. So the number is really probably close to two thirds of the world has, has experienced a nonviolent movement. But in a couple of weeks, at least, we'll be able to uh, kind of qualify that a little bit and say what kind of nonviolence was that that we were dealing with? Why wasn't it more successful and so forth? But uh, for you, Laura, I wanted to point out that they have a brief bibliography at the end. And one item is, uh, is there no other way to search for a nonviolent future? Berkeley Hills Books 2001. Yeah, yeah thanks. Thank you, Laura. OK, so there were a couple of questions that have come in. And one of them had to do with how do we maintain our nonviolence, how do we act with a person who has what we like to call these days a toxic personality and is costing you, you know, is grinding you down, draining your energy. One of the things that we always used to say when we were doing meditation retreats 
uh, was you have to protect your core. I mean, there's a point where if a person is sapping your capacity to be of use, you have to shut that person off. But the, the question really seemed to come down to, and I'm going to turn it over to the NVC people in a minute and all the rest of us, but the question came down to how do you affect a person for whom it seems like you can have no effect, you can have no impact. So at that point, I up and said, we cannot predicate our behavior on the guarantee of success. Uh, at, if we, I know, it's very unlikely, but if we cover everything today that I really wanted to cover, we will talk a little bit about how the Bhagavad Gita describes human action and the correct approach, the correct address to action. And the formula is choose the correct goal, use the correct means, parenthesis, nonviolence, and then get detached from the results. And uh, there's, a, there's a verse in chapter two, which is said to be Mahatma Gandhi's kind of, uh, his mantra, which was, you have every right to work, but no right to the results. So if we hold ourselves back from action waiting for some guarantee that we're going to get the result we want, we'll be paralyzing ourselves and we'll be neglecting the inner dimension of our action. Because later on today, if this class actually goes for about nine hours and I get to everything, <laughs> we'll be talking about Aidan Balu, who was an early American nonviolent uh, activist and wrote a very important book in the early 19th century. And he said, uh, you know, because people, he faced the same objections that we're facing today. You know, we haven't really gotten that far. People kept saying, what if they don't respond? What if they don't respond? And he, this was before they had airplanes and drones. So, uh, but he said, the one thing they can never take away from you is to not, that you cannot hate them. And that's huge. I mean, he didn't say that's huge, you know, this is a <laughs> that's only about 10 years old, that expression. Uh, but, you know, and Martin Luther King said, I will never let anyone drag me so low as to make me hate him. So characteristically, we forget the inner dimension. When we remember it, then the question is cleared up. We can act in such a way that we protect our core and we don't descend into a dehumanization of the other person. Once we've done that, you know, then I think we'll, we're kind of, we're not quite home free, but we can then choose a very act accurately what we should do with regard to that person. Now, it, a nonviolent person will tend to uh, really go a long way before, Excuse me, before he or she gives up on someone. Uh, but that's a kind of qualitative difference, you know? Okay? So then another question that came from Monica was, why am I going on and on about scapegoating? What does this have to do with nonviolence? Well, the reason I was doing that is that I'm trying to give us tools with which we can pick up where nonviolence is happening in a system and, well, sorry, let's back up a second, where violence is built into a system and how nonviolence has come about to overcome that violence. Because not all violence is in your face. You know, not all violence is physical. That's part of the whole point of our definition here. So Johann Galton, who gave us a lot of beautiful language, and I mean, this, this person has enough bibliography for 10 full professors to get tenure on. But he, he wrote and wrote and wrote, and it's all good. That's the amazing thing. But one of the things that he gifted us with, I think if this was he, was this concept of structural violence. Uh, for example, the f one that would leap to mind for us right now is the enormous inequality in wealth. There's never been anything like this. And uh, that this is 
a kind of violence which is within the law and which is not evident. It's built into the structure. So scapegoating is a kind of interesting hybrid, which is a uh, the way René Girard describes it, it's a plan for active violence. So it's structural insofar as it's built into your myths and your culture. You know, you're not actually killing anyone with it yet. But when the tension gets too high and you need that kind of an outlet, suddenly it bursts into life, you know, if you want to call that life, bursts into death, if you will. And uh, so it's interesting, partly structural and partly active violence. But the point is that <clears throat> to look back at the whole Western tradition where the word nonviolence only came about about 1926 as a rather bad translation of ahimsa and where there were no scholars studying this stuff, we have to f know where to look for the the forms of violence that were in the world and the forms of nonviolence that came to meet it. And my point was that uh, if you look at the life of Jesus, for example, there are clear clues that he was picking up something from ancient Judaism and turning it into a rejection of the scapegoating system. And when he did that, he was deconstructing, that's the term we like to use these days, he was deconstructing a very violent system that was built into culture, into society. It was a very bad means for society to keep from blowing up at the seams, was to pick a victim and act unanimously against that victim. And you, uh, I never knew that. You know, it's, it's extremely interesting. And well, I shared this with my students when I got to teach a Greek religion course at Berkeley one time and they said, you know, at first it's startling and you, you say what Monica said, you know, why are we talking about this? And then you start to see it everywhere. And you start to see much more subtle systems that are built into our culture which are ready to become a, a, an outbreak of unanimous violence. In a sense, even using the word terrorist is to dehumanize another person and set them up for scapegoating when you need, when you feel you need that kind of release from your tension. Incidentally, speaking of Berkeley, there actually was a guy on campus, I think it was around 2004 or something, who brought a goat to Sather Gate and he hung a sign on it and you're saying that it was a scapegoat. He said, everybody wants a scapegoat. I've got one. <laughs> anyway, so, so that was the reason. And let's see, uh, I didn't, just, just still an announcement or two, I didn't do much by way of getting us a worksheet for this session, but I will be putting some things into it. There's, there's two books which I think would probably be particularly pertinent. And one is René Girard's book. Um, and as I mentioned last time, he wrote about seven books. Some of, them are, some of them are incredibly long, and one of them is very short. So I picked the short one, knowing, knowing the, you know, the attention span of modern homo sapiens. And uh, that they all have the basic model in them, so you'll get what you need out of it. And it's called Job, the Victim of His People. And his point was that when Job says, you can do whatever you want to me, but I'm not guilty, he uh, kind of breaks the, the, the mold. He destroys the scapegoat system because the myth has to include the idea that the victim is guilty. And they know they're guilty. They have to be like Oedipus. You got me. Yeah, I'm guilty. And you know what? I'm, you don't even have to punish me. I'll take care of it. So the guilt doesn't fall on you. He's the perfect victim. Uh, Job is like a scapegoat victim from hell, if you want to put it that way. He, he's, a, he's the last kind of person that you want to be your scapegoat because he says, go ahead, but it's your problem. I didn't do anything. And the, the story of Jesus who goes to his death in complete innocence and does not say on the cross, 
you know, you got me. <laughs> I'm guilty. He says, forgive them. They know not what they do. Uh, one of the few things that we think we can reliably attribute is there something Jesus actually said. Uh, it was again that he was breaking up the scapegoating system. And another way that he did that was the problems that he had. Now, Fancy is going to love this part. The problems that he had with the Jewish temple. <clears throat> because the temple in, the, in his lifetime <clears throat> had become basically an abattoir. It was a, it was a slaughterhouse. Everybody brought these sacrificial animals to the temple, gave them to the priests. The priests would, uh, you know, accept the sacrifice, kill the animal, and then say to people, bless you, my son, you know, your sins are forgiven. And then, you know, use the animal for, if it wasn't a holocaust, they would use the animal for food. And it was all about buying an animal to be sacrificed for gods, even though it says somewhere in the Jewish Bible, I'm a non-practicing one, so I, you know, I didn't read all this stuff. Uh, ask me about Homer, but not about the Jewish Bible. But it does say somewhere, the Lord says, I don't want your, your sacrificial animals. I want you to give up your violence. So um, we know, looking through the fog of history, and it's very hard to say what Jesus actually did and said, but looking through that fog, we can see that he had some trouble with the temple, and the temple had trouble with him. And uh, our best guess, I think, is that he was against animal sacrifice because everyone like him, Buddha and so forth, they're all against animal sacrifice. And the reason he was against it, according to one fellow whose book I like to recommend, his name is Keith Akers, A-K-E-R-S, and the book is called The Lost Religion of Jesus. Boy, if I had a type, title like that instead of the Nonviolence Handbook, I'd probably be on TED Talk every other week. Anyway, this is rather a wonderful book, really, even though, or parenthesis, perhaps because he wasn't a scholar, <laughs> close parenthesis. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful book, and he argues that Jesus was vehemently against animal sacrifice because he was a vegetarian. Uh, he may well have been a vegetarian, you know, but I think the reason he was against it was that he was intuitively aware that animal sacrifice was a code for scapegoat, scapegoating, for unanimous violence. And by breaking that up, he was depriving society of a ready tool to react in unanimous violence against an inconvenient person or community. And it's not a coincidence, if I may ramble on a little bit, that the uh, Jewish genocide uh, during World War II is called a Holocaust. Because that's what it, so it was. It was a sacrifice in which you utterly destroy the victim instead of uh, using it. Okay, so uh, my, my plan for today, which is already hopelessly impossible to fulfill, was to uh, go over some of these strands of violence and nonviolence that we can pick up in the West and then maybe take a break and then talk about the Vedanta as Gandhi's background and this will prepare us for next week. <laughs> Incidentally, this morning the idea was launched and at Meta no sooner is an idea launched than it is executed, <laughs> which is that <laughs> the next course of this kind will be on Gandhi. The whole course will be the life and career meaning of Gandhi. Okay. So I uh, wanted to pick up something that we said we were going to do and didn't really get around to and touch on it very briefly, and that is the question of organization and knowing new organizational models and patterns. I picked up a phrase from an article, a book actually, by Chris Hedges, an important book called War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning. I mean, I would call it war is a lie that gives us meaning. <laughs> but the last line of that book, I think, is where he says, the only thing that can overcome war is love, and love cannot be organized. <clears throat> and if, if I were in the audience when he were doing this as a talk, I would say, hello, Mr. Hedges, have you heard of nonviolence? Because that's what nonviolence is. 
It's organized love. It's taking the power, the, what does our friend Swami Muktananda call it? The binding force among all creatures and organizing it into structures, institutions, and behavior. So uh, in, once you realize this, you, uh, you have to realize that the modern corporation is not organized love. You know, those of you who may live in the South Bay, you know that you might be working in a big firm for a good salary, and you show up in the morning, and for some reason there's all of these card tables on the sidewalk, and what's happened is that you and about 10,000 of your colleagues have been fired. So your belongings are on the desk, you're out of work, that's it. And the whole uh, structure of the corporation, which is so hierarchical and so much deprives the individual of his or her creativity and their input, their contribution, is not a nonviolent system. A nonviolent system, by contrast, attempts to mobilize the contribution of everyone, every single person. And I remember when I was challenged, when I was applying for conscientious objector status in, back in Brooklyn, oh yes, by the way, I applied for CEO status in Brooklyn. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people said to me, you're depriving society of your contribution. And I said, I am giving society my contribution, which if I were put on a uniform and say, go ahead, order me, I'll kill anybody, I would be depriving them of what I know, which is that this is wrong. Uh, so we were looking eagerly to other forms of organization. And there's a tendency, as always, to go into reactive mode and abandon all authority and abandon all structure. And I have to say, there's something appealing about this, <laughs> uh, except if I'm the one in authority, you know, you know as, as our former president with a four-letter name, I forget his name, <laughs> he said it would be a lot easier if this place were a dictatorship and I was a dictator. Yeah, he actually said that. It's on film. Anyway, there's a tendency to, uh, you know, dump authority altogether. And that's what we did in the free speech movement, and, which we're going to celebrate next uh, weekend. And it turns out that was kind of a mistake. And we, we latched on to a very interesting book that was written by two fellows, one of whom was a PAX major, called The Starfish and the Spider. And the reason for those two animals is uh, if you decapitate a spider, it dies like most of us. But in the case of a starfish, if you cut off one of its arms, the starfish will regenerate another arm. And in fact, in some species, the arm will regenerate another starfish. And he quotes this wonderful contrasting example that when uh, Hernán Cortés landed in Teotihuacán, it took him about two years to obliterate the Aztec Empire. And I mean obliterate. Every single institution was gone, and all of their movable wealth was on galleons on its way to, England, uh, to Spain, actually. A lot of it ended up in England, thanks to piracy. But uh, no, it was a form of war known as, should have been known as piracy. Anyway, uh, the point is that in two years he was able to overcome an entire civilization. So he got very enthusiastic. This is just the kind of thing that you like to do if you are a conquistador. And he said, let's go north and do it to the Apache. And 200 years later, they had not subdued the Apaches. And the reason is that Aztec civilization was completely hierarchical. They had a treasury, which was, you know, was really dumb, a high priest, you know, and a political king. You get rid of them, you decapitated the entire civilization, nobody knew what to do in their wealth. Whereas Aztecs organized themselves into what we would tend to call affinity groups. You know, they're just bands of maybe 20 to 40 people. 40 people seems to be the optimum for a hunter-gatherer uh, civilization. And they had a leader, but that leader was replaceable. So if he, and it's always a he, if he were 
lost, yeah, <laughs> has been anyway. If he were lost, there would be a replacement. Incidentally, in I don't know about the Apache, but in many Native American groups, the women were the kingmakers. They would have to decide who would be the next leader. And so th for that reason, they were a very robust civilization, and it took them all that time. Uh, so to make a long story short, the final outcome of their book, the subtitle of which is the unstoppable power of leader, leaderless organizations. But belying that subtitle, their actual finding was that the most successful organizations are ones that have found a sweet spot between complete leaderlessness and a CEO with a salary of $3 million a month, you know, because you can hire, fire at will, and so forth. And that is a a kind of benevolent leadership. Now, I would like to go a step further and say that it's not just in the structure, but it is in the, in the um, kind of leadership, in the kind of energy that the leader... What is it... Okay, let me, uh, let me start it again this way. What is it that makes that leader a leader? What is it that allows him or her to gather people around him or her. And this is going to be important when we look at uh, Gandhi's leadership next week. Because in one way, if you looked at it just from the point of structure, you would say this guy was extremely autocratic. And he actually said when a campaign was in swing, he said, you elected me to be your dictator, I expect you to follow my suggestions. He said. But he also said, if the minute you don't want me, I'm out of here. You know, I'm not Augusto Pinochet who's going to, you know, cling to power no matter what, or Museveni or any number of people, or Charles Taylor. <laughs> so um, he had, a, it, was, it was structurally, it was a hierarchical type of organizing that he had himself, he had about 12 very close people. He had about 60 more people who lived in the ashram as a next year. He had maybe a couple of thousand people around India who had participated in a major satyagraha, like at Bardoli, maybe back in Champaran, knew the, knew the routine, you know, they knew the drill. And then there were the ordinary people who for various reasons were responsive to the kind of leadership that he offered. Uh, so that it was, a, it was a pyramid, which is the kind of thing that we're supposed to hate and not have in the free, after the free speech movement. But it was a pyramid based on love, not on egotism. So it's an odd thing. So how are we going to discover the correct blend for something like that in our own situation? Let me say one more little thing about the, uh, the way that the kind of charisma and the organization. I realize that I've, I must have had some caffeine this morning because I am rolling on and on. I wanted to say, and forgot conveniently, that I was very pleased that we were more interactive last week. And now I haven't allowed you to have a single syllable so far and we're halfway through. But, you know, what can you do? Do what I say, not what I do. Uh, uh, one more thing on the kind of leadership. I've noticed that in some ways, even um, what we would call pop culture in India has picked up some spiritual guidelines. And one of them is, even if you watch these, in a way, ridiculously silly movie versions of the great epics, Mahabharata and the Ramayana, where you know, rockets are flying through the air, and it, it's basically a cowboy movie on that level. But you often run across these uh, glimpses of spiritual insight. And one of them is that in the last analysis, when you really need power, the way you get it is to give up something. Utterly foreign to our way of thinking. But for example, in the Ramayana, 
Rama is not doing very well in the battle against Ravana. And Ravana is absolute evil, so no problem here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, Kerry. He, he's a very destructive person. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, so Rama is at a point where uh, even he needs some more power. He decides to offer a special sacrifice to Goddess, which he says he will uh, offer to her 24 lotuses. So he collects what he thinks are 24 lotuses, and he sits down in front of the puja, and he, with each one he says, you know, Om Lakshmaya Namaha, I offer this to the Divine Mother, offer this to the Divine Mother. He counts out 23 lotuses, and then he reaches and, oops, uh-oh, no lotus, he miscounted. He's, he's, his math is not as good as his meditation. And he is stuck, because the worst thing that you can do is start a sacrifice and not finish it much better off never offering it in the first place. Because when you start a sacrifice, you contact power. But if you don't finish the sacrifice, you leave a breach for that wrong kind of power to come in. What is he going to do? Well, uh, never would have occurred to me, but that's because I'm not an avatar, and he is. Uh, he realizes that he is called the Vishalakshi, the one with lotus eyes. So he reaches in his quiver, he takes out a sharp arrow, and he is about to poke out his eye and offer it to the goddess when, poof, she appears and says, it's okay, it's okay, I get it. Yeah. I will accept 23 for today. For you, 23. <laughs> so, uh, now the point is, you know, this is kind of a sacrifice of Isaac, and it doesn't quite have to happen, but the point is that the sacrifice of the ina inanimate object is a symbol for self-sacrifice, the rendering of one's own life, one's own person, and this gives him the power that he needs to overcome evil. So we're talking myth and, and ritual, but now let's fast forward to the summer of 1906. It's July of 1906. Gandhi has enlisted an ambulance corps in South Africa to uh, perform his duty as a citizen of the empire in an event which is known to history as the Zulu Rebellion. But that's because the British got to write the history. In reality, it was a hideous, punitive expedition against the Zulus. So he sees racism face to face for the first time in his life. And he realizes now uh, others have also seen, this is not just my own interpretation, he realizes the extent, the depth of the destructive force that he is up against. And he realizes that he needs some extraordinary power to overcome it. And he takes two vows, which are enough to make your hair stand on end, if you have any. <laughs> That's why we sometimes don't have it, because it can be very inconvenient. So the first vow is a parigraha, or non-possession. He will never again regard anything as owned by him. Nothing is his. And second, if that were not horrendous enough, the vow of brahmacharya, or complete abstinence, sexual continence. And sh what do you know? Three months later, uh, September 11th, 1906, he's in the Empire Jewish Theater with an audience of 5,000, and he launches Satyagraha. So the myth is a code for something that is very real, and which uh, Gandhi intuitively was aware of, and Indians intuitively recognized what he was doing. Okay, okay so let me now, maybe, in fact, pause for a minute, see, is there anything that came up? Yeah? Um, when you were talking about the starfish and the spider, mm -hmm. I think you said Aztec, and I think you meant Apache. Well, at first it was the Aztecs that, that he did overcome, and then they said, let's go north, okay. and they faced the Apaches. Yeah. 
think she's right. I think that you switched it. it oh, did I? Oh, that's right. Apache were the, the, like, the least organized, right? Yes. Right. Yes. Or actually, they had a different kind of organization. Yes, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They were. They were uh, caracoles. Caracoles? Yeah. I don't even know that much about that, but that would be interesting. It would be a very interesting form to look at, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jill? Um, not having read Gerard's book yet, it, in thinking about the scapegoating cycle, uh -huh. if the scapegoat has the power to break the cycle, uh -huh. the scapegoat is really the one who holds the most power in the cycle. Uh -huh. Critical point. Who, who gets to tell the story? Because um, a scapegoat can go down saying, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, mm -hmm. and you can tell the story that we knew this person was guilty. Mm -hmm. And more or less we can prove it. More than that, we can prove it. Because the minute we expelled the Jews from this community, the plague went away. Mm -hmm. So it's a, that's a really critical point. Mm -hmm. Who tells the story? Yeah. And somehow... Whoever was in charge of putting together the early documentation of Jesus somehow got that's got this gave him a vo uh, you know held a microphone up to the cross, yeah. said what do you have to say, and got that recorded. Yeah. Michael, what would you say is the logic underneath uh, the uh, the creation, the conception and creation of scapegoating? I think the logic of it comes from an innate pattern in, and, I, and I'm going to say now that it's an innate pattern in nature, because we in fact pick up scapegoat behavior among monkeys. You know, you get a colony of monkeys and they get overcrowded, like they're on an island or something and there's so many of them, and you see them going around chattering among each other and then sure enough they pick out one group of monkeys and they drive them off or in some cases, uh, cannibalize them. So this is a, a natural s safety valve that prevents the complete chaotic destruction, com prevents Syria from happening by choosing a safety valve, which is not the most violent thing that could possibly happen, but it's far from being nonviolent because all it does is recycle the problem. It, it, vents some of the tension, but it will only build up again because you haven't changed the energy. So you're, you're directing um, a, a kind of stepped down amount of violent power instead of switching over to a different kind of power. So people feel that this is happening and they have a kind of folk memory and we don't understand how these things are transmitted but the human beings turn it into a narrative. So then, um, so you're suggesting this is kind of because it's in, we see it in, in other parts of nature that it's innate in humans and that we've developed uh, techniques like through spirituality yeah. to transform that energy? Yes. That tendency? Yes. Now, animals also have some ability to do this, but it, this is really a big mystery, this whole area. Uh, Stephanie was telling me the other day that uh, about this dog in Brazil that walks four miles crossing several busy freeways to get a bag of food and take it back to the dump where it lives and shares it with the other animals, including not dogs. So they have some capacities. That, and, and you know, I, there's this uh, famous case that uh, turned up the, the beavers of the Rhone Valley build dams and one year the level of the Rhone kind of was like California I guess the level of the Rhone went down to where the beavers couldn't build a dam and it stayed that way for f through five generations of beavers then the level of the river came back up and the new beavers immediately set about building dams just the way their ancestors had done five, year, five generations earlier. So how does this happen? We don't know how this, you know, there's no gene that tells you, you know, pick up a stick and shove it in. The, the genes can't do that. And they don't have epic poetry, to our knowledge. <laughs> 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 Among beavers, yeah. Like to hear it. 
<laughs> uh, wouldn't we like to hear that? I mean, there's a PhD. <laughs> yeah, Joe? Yeah. And tying it back to one of your original points, that's why it's so important to recognize the presence of nonviolence. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's what we are basically doing here. Mm -hmm. We have switched in, in Plato's language, we have switched from mythos to logos. We don't tell symbolic stories anymore. We, t we get Erica Chenoweth to do the statistics and write books telling the facts about how many uh, nonviolent episodes succeeded and how many didn't and so forth. So that's our medium, but this is what we're doing. We are trying to recapture, to recover a story, the, the greatest story ever told, if you will, which uh, is not, it's not prominent, it's not evident in our civilization. I mean, okay, as, as you know, I don't voluntarily watch television. But I do swim. And in order to swim, I have to change into my bathing suit. Uh, this is a social norm, in, even, even in California. <laughs> and uh, to change into my bathing suit, I have to go into the locker room with a lot of other guys. And they've got the TV on. So I can tell you that for two solid days, CNN did nothing but play over and over and over again the security camera capturing this football player, punching his fiance, over and over and over again. You know, it's just like a 60 second clip. And what is going to happen to your consciousness after you've watched this thing 100 times, 200 times, you know? So this is exactly what we are trying to do. We are trying to intervene on the story with a better story. Now, happy to say that we got our second clip of an animation that is is being done for us on the new story. Uh, this this is what we're about. Yeah, that's why it's so critically important. Yeah. Carol from the class online is uh -huh. asking for clarification. She says on scapegoating it personalizes the problem rather than addressing the root causes of systemic violence. Yes, that's another thing that you can say about scapegoating that rather than digging up the structure that causes the tension in the first place, you load it onto a person, or later on you load it onto an animal. And I mean, the term scapegoat comes from the fact that the Jews used to parade a goat through the community and everybody would put its hand on that goat and say, I give you all of my sins. And then they would drive the goat out into the wilderness. So yeah, you're trying to incorporate, embody the systemic problem in a living creature and then <clears throat> give it away, get rid of it, drive it out. Yeah. Would you say that blaming the president, saying it's all the president's fault is a form of it's, it, Yeah, it's a form of scapegoating. It's a rudimentary form because we don't have a whole myth about it. But Girard points out that our tendency to elevate somebody to the top of the pyramid one day and vilify that person the next day is part of scapegoating logic. The person was just a human being all along. But you know, this, I would call this one, hail to the chief, jail to the chief. You know, we have Nixon, <laughs> the victorious thing. And next thing you know, he's on a helicopter on his way out in the most disgraceful episode that ever befell the presidency. So, yeah, and our, our tendency to scandalize uh, heroes from any walk of life, be they athletes, actors, anyone who, who we've pushed up on a pedestal, be careful because we're doing that for a reason, to push you down on the other side. Yeah. So if you were to read Gerard, you'll see that I am really oversimplifying, but this is the basic dynamic. Yeah, Joe. The hope is, I don't know if everyone can hear, everyone hear Jill's question? Should the new story expose the workings of the cycle? I would like to think that it won't be necessary. I would love it if it went this way. We would 
uh, create, disseminate such a compelling story that the cycle would go away by itself. Because when the tensions would start to rise, we would call NVC, <laughs> get them in here. <laughs> we would have the systems in place to deal with it and they would never reach that point. And dehumanization would not take root, so it would be hard to find a victim. Or decanonization is the case maybe. <laughs> yeah. I would hope it would work that way. But because we are where I forget whether we're left brain or right brain people, we're hyper rational, it's useful for us to do the analysis. For us who really are trying to as as Goethe's Faust says, Schau alle Wirkungskraft und Samen und tu nicht mehr in Worten kramen. That is to dig out the dynamic principles under life, underlying life, and stop just mucking around with words. Uh, uh, we're trying to do this. I, I'm not sure everybody has to be able to do it. But if they if they have to, we're there. You know, we can we can explain it. Okay. So uh, I was afraid that we would fall slightly behind, but behind, but we have fell drastically behind. But it, it was it was extremely uh, delightful, and uh, I'd like to pick out a few more of these strands where we can see nonviolence happening. And I've been emphasizing uh, the introduction of monotheism in the West. And the reason I believe that monotheism, monotheism does this for you is that if you believe in multiple gods, you're actually saying that your community is radically separate from our community, existentially different. We are Zeus people, you're Athena people, or maybe you're even Ahura Mazda people. And so your entire reality is grounded in something utterly separate from our reality. Where the minute you say, Adonai Echad, God is one, you're saying at the deepest level we are one. And at that point it becomes impossible really to maintain that complete existential rejection and othering of the other. So what happens uh, is, you know, the monotheism gets introduced. It challenges the community. Some people in the community welcome it with open arms. Others welcome it with some reluctance. After a while, you realize that this, by the way, is known as Nagler's theory of religion. <laughs> that you have a, uh, a revelation figure, like in this case, we're talking about uh, mainly Jesus. He presents a standard, a behavior, which galvanizes people, tremendous excitement. You begin to realize that it's awfully difficult to carry it out. I remember driving in a car one time with Norman Cousins. I'm a great name dropper. <laughs> and he, he said, can you imagine what would happen if people took the gospel seriously? And I said, it would spoil your whole day. <laughs> Because it's terribly, terribly difficult to live up to that. So you're faced with this choice. Either drop the whole story, which brings back in the scapegoat narrative, or modify it to where people can at least use the best parts of it to some degree. And so then you have a period of accommodation, and that starts degenerating further and further until finally you're left with a situation where the only thing that's left of the original revel revelation is its prestige. And you can now fasten that prestige onto the exact opposite of everything that it stands for. And I remember standing in the parking lot one time in our ashram. We try to be very non-political. You know, I don't know how you, you probably don't have to do this at Green Gulch, but we're trying to be very unpolitical. But I had a bumper sticker on my car which said favor of George McGovern. I know I'm dating myself. This is 1972. And I was standing there with a visitor who I did not realize I was a very con politically conservative person. And he looked at my bumper sticker with some chagrin and he said, well, as a man of God, I'm for Nixon. 
whoa. <laughs> so, the, and then Justice Scalia recently said, the more Christian a country, is, get this, the more Christian a country is, the more it can execute. So when you've reached this point, you're taking the system and you've stripped away everything that it stood for and taking only its authority, only its prestige, and attaching it to whatever is convenient for you, which turns out to be the exact opposite of what the system came into being for. When that happens, it, it starts to break down and you need a new revelation and launch it again. So if you read the other book that I thought would be useful for today, Jeffrey Nuttall, uh, Christian Pacifism in History, now he's looking at one criterion. We were just looking at a uh, scapegoat system inbuilt in society. He's looking at war and pacifism. And he shows that there have been five waves of the rediscovery of pacifism in Christian history, from the original revelation of Jesus down to the present day. And uh, the first wave lasted almost 300 years. It's, uh, it was, was kind of cool. Um, up till the year 312 of our era, you could say, and there was a young man named Martinianos in North Africa who said, non possum militari Christianus sum. Sorry, I cannot enlist in the army. I'm a Christian. And... 30 or 40 years later, you were not allowed to enlist in certain elite legions of the Roman army unless you were a Christian. So there's this complete turnaround. And incidentally, Martinianus was summarily executed. It was a non-judicial procedure. They just took him out and executed him. If you, didn't, if you weren't a soldier, you weren't a real person. And you were a threat and uh, you deserved to be scapegoated. So he was the first martyr for conscientious objector status in, in the West. Now, the reason that I picked the year 312 is, if I'm remembering the number correctly, you know, I'm within, give or take, five years, five more or less, because I'm, I'm in the humanities. Uh, that was the year that the Emperor Constantine was going to the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, and he had a dream, how convenient, in which the cross appeared in the sky, and it said across it, I guess in dreams you have these kind of banners, like, you know, in Times Square they go across, or underneath any television program, actually. I want to say something about that if we get around to it. But this said, in hoc signo vinces, you will be victorious with this symbol. And he said, oh, I get it, or however you say that in Latin. And he converted to Christianity and made it the official religion of the empire. So then it sucked this anti-state system. Remember, Jesus being against the temple basically meant he was against the government. That was where the authority was vested in that theocratic culture. So you've now come full circle and you've made it the state and the compromise starts rolling and you start telling stories about how Christian legions were protected when other legions were not. Then you have uh, the sack of Rome by the wrong kind of Christians, the Aryan Christians, and poor Augustine has to write this enormous, enormous book called The City of God in order to explain that it was not the Christian's fault that Rome was sacked. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad he wrote it. It's an incredible document. It says wonderful things about peace, but uh, it shows the, pe the people were afraid that because they abandoned their, their religion, they were victimized by the Ostrogoths coming from Sweden. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that was the heyday of Swedish power in Southern Europe. <laughs> um, so, but then as you go on in history, there are individuals who read the gospel documents and take them seriously, very dangerous. And they realize that they should not be killing. And the, the, there was a motto that in, uh, in uh, his response to Peter, 
Jesus ungirt every soldier. You remember in Gethsemane, Peter takes out his sword to defend Jesus. He cuts off the ear of one of the Roman centurions. And Jesus says to him, put up thy sword, because he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. And in doing that, he rendered militarism immoral. It should not be undertaken by a Christian. A monotheistic, it makes a certain amount of sense that a monotheistic person cannot say, you are the empire of evil, you know, you are, they could, they could not, I'm thinking now of a famous governor of Alaska, no names please, uh, very pretty, uh, who, 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 said, who said, yeah, who said of, of waterboarding, this is how we baptize terrorists. Pro approximately the most dangerous, the most destructive remark that I've heard in the last 20 years, and that's saying a lot. But um, so you have this rediscovery, and Nuttall will give you the various uh, phases, like he talks about the Bogomils, Bogomil, meaning friends of God. It uh, started in Bohemia, what, it, what is now Czechoslovakia, or the Czechoslovak Republic, I'm not sure which one. Czech Republic. Czech Republic, thank you. It's good to have an expert from any <laughs> corner of the world here. Uh, he talks about the Cathars in the south of France who were, uh, from all accounts, and it's, incidentally, it's hard to get any accounts because the first thing that the northern French did when they conquered them was destroy all of their documents. It's very hard. But apparently one of the things that they practiced and upheld was uh, n pacifism, you know, non-militarism. And that may have been the thing that made them seem most dangerous to uh, the French kings. So anyway, that takes us down to the 12th century. Obviously, I'm Gallic lumping through history here. But he identifies five phases of Christian pacifism, each one having a slightly different angle, which is interesting. Like the first angle in the Roman world, most of the Ro Christianized Romans didn't say, I, don't, I cannot kill because killing a fellow human being is wrong. They said, I cannot swear allegiance to Caesar because I've already sworn to Jesus. It was interesting that they chose that. It's difficult for human beings to actually come out and say what they're doing. I've noticed this. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, one of the waves uh, that I'd, I'd like to focus on a little bit, but before I do, let me... Uh, yeah, there's, there's a couple of things I'd like to touch on quickly before I get down to the Quakers. Is anybody here a Quaker, by the way? In okay, case so maybe someone... I'm related to some. You're related to some, okay. I live in an ashram with two of them. Yeah. Um, now that we're becoming a little more aware of this criterion, violent or nonviolent, some historians are starting to pick up the history of nonviolence and recover it for us. And the John Dominic Crossan, who is the probably the leader of the Jesus of History movement, you know, Jesus of History versus the Christ of Faith. In other words, strip away the mythology and who was this man and what did he actually say, has identified seven nonviolent uprisings in the Jewish world between the years 4 to 65 in the Common Era. Uh, they all had specific goals. They all were nonviolent in their practices. Four out of seven of them succeeded, okay, without any loss of life. For example, uh, Flavius Josephus, the, the Jewish historian, reports a uh, an uprising, a spontaneous uprising, that's important. So we're going to talk about capturing spontaneity and institutionalizing it. But a spontaneous uprising of ordinary Jews against Pontius Pilate, who had been ordered to put the standards, you know, kind of Facebook pictures of Caesar around the walls of the Jewish temple. And uh, 
the Jews said, this is sacrilege, we cannot allow this. And Pilate said, well, in that case, I may have to kill all of you. And they said, go ahead, we are ready to die. So that's why I call it stage three on my escalation curve. They were willing to lay down their life and Pilate backed down, said, okay, we can't do it then. And just slightly prior to that, there was a, a Syrian legate by the name of Petronius, who was ordered by Caligula to install a statue of himself in the temple. And it's kind of interesting. I'm comparing in my mind here as I'm saying this, what caused the British to fail in India? What caused them to fail in the last analysis was they did not realize the tremendous spiritual appeal that Gandhi had. They thought because they had brought the Anglican Church into India, that they had all the spiritual authority. And there's even a conversation that took place in Cairo where uh, a person in the presence of Jan Smuts, who was, and, and Churchill, was in quite a dinner party, uh, Smuts said the reason that we failed against, to prevail against Gandhi was that he had all the religious authority. And Churchill said, oh, well, nonsense, you see. You know, I've appointed many bishops. I have plenty of spiritual authority. It's just absolutely irrelevant. Similarly, Caligula failed to acknowledge the power of spirituality among the Jewish people who were fighting for everything that they regarded as sacred. And he, he, he did know that, it, that they, their religion was important to them. And he thought, well, I'll just usurp it. Put a statue of me in the temple. Now, on both the political and the religious level, the Jews knew perfectly well what this meant. They appeared before uh, uh, Petronius and said, this cannot be allowed. And again, he said, OK, I'm going to order my men to kill you. They took out their swords. The Jews lay down on the floor of the temple and bared their necks, saying, go ahead, you know, here's the jugular. Go ahead, do it. We're ready. And Petronius got uh, cold feet. and wrote a letter to Caligula saying, maybe it wouldn't be a good idea to kill all of these people because it's harvest time. We need them. You know, they're our braceros. These are migrant workers here. <laughs> Same problem as we're having here. Now we have to recruit prisoners to go out and harvest the grapes so we can have enough wine. Ah, what a system. Anyway, um, Caligula wrote back and said, commit suicide to Petronius. You're, you're, you're disobeying my orders. Fortunately for Petronius and for world history, his letter was delayed. That's, you know, they, they didn't have email, so they had to write this thing on a piece of parchment and put it on a horse and put it on a boat. And by the time the letter reached Petronius, Caligula had been assassinated. So, so he heard about the assassination before he got the order to kill himself. This is just a little, I don't know how to account for all of this, but it's just, it's just an interesting side note. But the fact is that there seems to be something in, in human nature which was built upon by the Jews that was a recognition of what we call today in nonviolence the power of vulnerability. And if you had to carry it to the final stage, the vulnerability meant lay your head on the block and say, you know, go ahead, chop away. So this was in the Jewish background, and uh, Crossan discovered two very significant facts about the historical Jesus. One is that the Jews did not kill Jesus. Ironically enough, the biggest scapegoats in entire Western history are the very people that Jesus tried to save from scapegoating. It's so ironic. I mean, he arose as a figure to dis disestablish the scapegoating system and what had the result was his entire people got scapegoated. And the second thing that he discovered about Jesus was that he was nonviolent. He was trying to start a nonviolent revolution and he was being very Jewish about that. And uh, uh, Crossan has many reasons, uh, historical things to back that up. For example, if Jesus had been a violent revolutionary like Bar Kokhba, his entire following would have been killed and not just him. 
so on and so forth. So it's, it makes fascinating reading, and there's a little article that Crossan will write that was published in Tikkun a few years ago where he spells this out very succinctly if you needed to get it in short compass. Okay. So there is this uh, nonviolent awareness that's percolating through the Jewish world, and it comes in contrast, in conflict with uh, the uh, Christianization uh, of Rome and the remnants of the pagan empire. And in 404 AD, or 404 CE, whichever you like, uh, I'm going to tell you a story now which is probably historical. Uh, there are some variants. The name of the, our hero is uh, Telemachus. Let's see how good I am at this. He was a monk in Cappadocia, which is uh, Asia Minor, and he had a vision in which he was told, go to Rome and stop the gladiatorial games. So this, this was a hideous system that you will immediately recognize the dynamics of. You had everybody sitting in this big stadium, and you took some prisoners out, and you armed them and said, now f kill each other, and it will be extremely amusing. So this is... I would call the, the games where the scapegoat system televised. It was basically the same as NFL football. <laughs> Sorry, because... Uh, <laughs> okay, good. I thought you would not be. Uh, and as, as a Christian monk, you know, he, he got his, uh, his marching orders. And it was a march from Cappadocia to Rome, you can imagine. He got his marching orders. Go to Rome, stop the games. So he gets, the Ro he gets to Rome and he, uh, you know, he, he Googles uh, wh when's the next game. And I tell him, oh, I say, oh, there's this terrific game going on in the forum or the stadium, rather. Go on down, see what you can do. And they didn't have a security gate set up, so he marches into the stadium and he sees these men who are about to kill each other. And he goes, over to, goes right over to them. You know, the crowd is saying, who is this man? What's going on here? And he says, you know, you know, boys, why are we doing this? You know, don't kill each other. This is wrong. And uh, they look at one another and they say, you know, the guy has a point. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that scene in the in-laws, wonderful scene in the bar when uh, Peter Falk is trying to recruit uh, Alan Arkin into the CIA. And he says, you, but you have to stay alive. That's the key to the benefits program. <laughs> so if at most only one of us is going to stay alive, then, you know, our whole insurance policy is invalid. This does not make sense. They, darn it. They throw their swords down and they walk away. Okay, now the story is about to get very intense. The crowd, you can imagine the psychology of this crowd. We came here, we paid our four sisters to see fresh hot blood running on the sand, and we're not seeing it. They got infuriated, mob psychology kicked in, and they thronged onto the sands of the arena, and they beat uh, Telemachus to death. End of story? Not quite. It turns out that Emperor Honorius was in the stands, according to the most authoritative version at least. And he was so affected by what Telemachus had done and by the utter, the display of animal brutality in this crowd of Roman citizens who were acting no better than a pack of dogs. Pardon me, fancy no offense meant. <laughs> Look at how the way she's, yeah, she's domesticated, yeah. Um, that he went immediately to his scriptorium, you know, his his writing desk, his workstation, so to speak, and he issued what they called a rescript uh, abolishing the games. So this is a, a very dramatic example of nonviolent logic, and uh, personally I believe that it happened, but even if it didn't, the point is made because it shows that sacrifice correctly understood 
has a tremendous nonviolent power and can get things done. When you have to go to stage three, you go and it does the job. Now, I said sacrifice six correctly carried out. Actually, this one is pretty easy. What's the difference between a wrong sacrifice and a right sacrifice? In a wrong sacrifice, you sacrifice somebody else. <laughs> In a right sacrifice, you offer yourself. Okay. It, it also sounds like you're saying though, that a wrong sacrifice would be you sacrifice yourself, but the meaning of it is misunderstood, or the, mm. story, the story of it is misunderstood. Yes. That can also happen, that you can do the right sacrifice from your point of view, but the civilization doesn't pick it up. As it says in John, the light shines amid the darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. Yeah. yeah. Well, like I'm thinking like a few years ago, some of the students um, at UCB decided to go on a hunger strike, uh, and they didn't consult anyone, yeah. uh, including the people that they wanted to hunger strike for the cause. Yeah. It was you know, very strange because mm -hmm. the administration stepped in. And I remember. And began to talk about what is nonviolence and you're not yeah. doing it properly. Yeah, <laughs> so isn't it? Very strange. Very strange. Yeah. But in the, we have to say in this case the administration was right. Yeah. Yeah. The the students were really they were they noble. And noble. It's just that they yeah. Their whole problem was they didn't read our book. Mm -hmm. yes. They should have read. Is there no other way? I have a whole appendix already. There you go. Yeah. Or the handbook. Yeah. Or the handbook. Yeah. As I say, yeah. Very generous of you to mention that. Yeah. Yes, Joe. The idea that you know the story has to be interpreted, but the idea of work this versus work two and the and the quote up there that uh -huh. they still did good. Yeah. Yes, uh, because okay, I think we can go this far to say that to the degree that they did it in the right spirit, it had a positive effect, and I think we can absolutely trust that and believe it. As to where that effect will show up, we cannot say. We don't have the science yet to really pick up that, that to, to connect those dots. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a good application of the work versus work model. So what if I carry on just a little bit with... Um, another Christian development and then we'll take a break and then talk about the Vedanta. We will have covered about 8,000 years of human culture in three hours. Not bad. <laughs> I, I wanted to just talk about one of these waves of what's sometimes called a gospel literalism, the discovery that Jesus was nonviolent. And remember what Gandhi said, that the only people who do not know that Jesus was nonviolent were the Hindus. I'm sorry, are the Christians. Christians, I'm sorry. I really ruined that one. <laughs> are the Christians, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but what, there was a Christian who got it, and his name was George Fox. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, his name was George Fox, uh, and he... Uh, he left this precious document called the Journals of George Fox, where unfortunately the parts that we need most are missing. They've been expunged by his editors. And that was the parts where he talks about his mystical experiences. But some way or other, he had mystical experiences. And he became a completely independent person. He would walk across the British countryside, preaching, getting people back to the fundamental principles. He refused to use the word uh, church because for him the church was the community, not the building. So when they invited him to speak in a church, he said, you mean that steeple house? And he, he did things like refusing to use the, the formal form of English, you know, you instead of thou, when he was speaking to judges and things like that. He was a complete rebel. Alas, he ended up breaking his health in very, very severe prison conditions in the 17th century, which have, it took, it took uh, th almost 400 years for us to degenerate prison conditions to where they're, bad as, they're as bad as they were. They're as bad as they are now, 
as they were in the 17th century. And it took us a long period of degeneration, accommodation to get back to that state. Anyway, he was a tremendous uh, power influence and he started this, what shall we say, this sect, this group, this cult, which is called uh, by its friends, the Society of Friends. But they were stereotyped by mainstream Christians uh, as uh, Quakers because, you know, they would be affected by the, the Holy Spirit and they would tremble. So they have Quakers and Shakers and Holy Rollers and people who handle serpents, one of whom just died actually in Virginia, I believe, or North Carolina. So that was a stereotype, but they are known as Quakers. And there's about 200,000 of them in the world today. And you can either be a birthright Quaker, meaning you, inherit, you inherited it from your parents, or a Quaker by convincement, where you decide to be a Quaker because it looks good to you. And uh, they have several things that have made them a successful political movement. So this will tie in a little bit to our organization question. One thing was they were grounded in actual spiritual experience. You know, George Fox was some kind of mystic. And at one point he's in a, in a tavern in his travels and somebody who's partly drunk comes after him with a knife and he manages to talk that person out of it without offering him any violence. Classic nonviolent power. Uh, he He's very uh, solicitous of animals. He wants you know, his horse to be well taken care of. He had some kind of vision, which we don't know much about. Um, that's one thing that's important for them. Another thing that has helped them succeed is uh, that they are a tradition, that they, they're tied into this original founding impulse because there hasn't been any break in Quakers who were ultimately ones who were aware, aware of George Fox, who knew him, one of whom we're going to talk about very soon. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Thirdly, and I may not be able to remember this whole list with apologies to my Quaker friends, but one of the things that's kept them going, oh yeah, is they have a very good balance between uh, sp spiritual development and activism. So it never became a split for them. And fourthly, they have a capacity, which I would call non-ideological. They have a capacity to cooperate with groups that don't believe what they believe, but they will cooperate with them in uh, an action, in a campaign. Say, look, you don't have to buy into what we think George Fox was and all of this uh, rhetoric, but we can act together and then if we need to, we'll go our separate ways. So, um, yes, Maya. Um, they don't have a priesthood. Right, that is. Which I'm understanding as one of the ways it's kept alive. Yeah. Because the, the connection has to be within. Yeah. That's, the f that, that's probably the fifth point that I was groping for, that you have to bring it up from within and they, have a, at least a, they at least make an attempt to do that. So if you go to a Quaker meeting, which is a meeting for worship, uh, as I understand it, I, I've never attended one, you sit there in silence until somebody receives an impulse to speak. And uh, so there's no hierarchy. And there's not very much really in terms of a set of holy scriptures that you have to you can you thump. George Fox actually came to what was to become the United States of America. He came to an area called Virginia. And uh, at one point he had a uh, conversation with a, of a uh, plantation owner in Virginia. And the plantation owner was saying that Native Americans are not humans. They don't have a soul. And there was one standing there patiently listening to all of this. And Fox called him over and said, uh, tell me, my good man, uh, do you ever tell a lie? And the fellow, you know, shuffled 
his moccasins and said, yes, I have to confess, I sometimes do this. And the, uh, slave, the slave owner and plantation owner said, see, I told you so. But then Fox said to him, how do you feel when you do that? He said, yeah, I don't feel very good. You know, it bothers me. And Fox said, I told you so. This proves that he has a soul. So uh, one, uh, I'm, I'm going very quickly here. Like, so what else is new? That one of Fox's followers was William Penn, a name which you recognize from your favorite brand of motor oil, <laughs> Penn's oil. Um, and William Penn's father, also known as William Penn, was an admiral who had uh, saved Charles II during the Irish Rebellion, helped him put down the Irish, something which the British kings commonly did, which is one of the reasons that the Scots are deciding next week whether they want to be part of the Commonwealth or not. Uh, anyway, uh, the long story short, Charles II owed William Penn Sr. an enormous sum of money that he should never, would never be able to pay, but he didn't have to because he had America. So he took this enormous piece of land, which is now Pennsylvania and Delaware, and gave it to William Penn Jr. because William Penn Sr. had passed on, and that was in 1681. And immediately, uh, Penn uh, set out for the colonies and he started uh, formulating what became known as the Great Law, Great Law of 1682, uh, which was an extremely progressive document. It's unbelievable that this thing happened in the 17th century. And uh, when I was writing about this in Is There No Other Way, we had just passed a reforming act in 1992, something which in many, many ways was way behind the great law. And this will be true of the entire setup, the entire institution, the whole civilization that he built in what is now Pennsylvania. So for example, uh, there were two crimes that were capital, punishable by death. You might think, well, okay, what's so progressive about that? Well, English law had 200 such crimes. Um, they had the beginnings of what we call today restorative justice in the sense that prisons were not there primarily for punishment, but primarily for restitution. And every prison had a workhouse, which could put the inmates to work, give them, because most prisoners were in prison for debt. This gave them an opportunity to work off their debt, earn a skill. And it's, uh, again, that this thing could have happened. This law, incidentally, became law on December 7th, a day which we think of as a day that will go down in infamy, but it should be a famous day when this document w became law. Uh, all cases were to be tried by a jury, which was... Uh, you know, not always the case in those days. If you've seen The Crucible, you'd know that a judge could, was the judge, jury, and executioner all in one. Now, there were some things about it that we think might have been a little bit, bit overboard, like swearing and lying were illegal under <laughs> the great law. I think this, oh, oh okay, you know, this a little, reads a little, bit, uh, a little bit puritanical for us. But uh, another thing that it did, of course, was to abolish war. And therefore, when other colonies were at war against the Native Americans, or against the French, or against uh, the, eventually against the English, of course, in 76, uh, Quakers to this day can get conscientious objector status just by being Quakers. See, I couldn't get it because I wasn't a Quaker, but, uh, but I, I had the next best thing. I had a daughter. So anyway, but that's just my personal problem. We don't need to worry about that. But yeah, it's almost time for a break. Let me just say 
a couple of things about what he did in Pennsylvania. Uh, it was named after his father and is now his, this episode in American history is known as the Holy Experiment. And it lasted for 70 years. And I think it shows three things very clearly. One that, well, maybe it's going to end up being fourth. So bear with me. One that nonviolence prevails because the Pennsylvania was able to enjoy peace when the other colonies were not. And everybody thought, oh my gosh, if you don't have a militia, you're going to be vulnerable. And it turns out that there is something called the power of vulnerability that protected them. Let me read you something from his letter that he wrote to the Native Americans before he even left England. He said, I am very sensible, I am very aware of the unkindness and injustice that has, hath been too much exercised toward you. But I have high regard for you, and I desire to win and gain your love and friendship by a kind, just, and peaceable life. This he writes to people whom others thought were not humans in, in 1682. Um, so one point that nonviolence has its own power. Secondly, it does not, it is not confined to insurrectionary movements from below. Penn was totally in charge of the entire colony. He could have set himself up as judge, jury, executioner. He could have declared himself God. Well, he would have gotten into a little bit of trouble for that. But uh, there are at least two episodes in history where nonviolence has been declared as the regime by the rulers. Third, it did not, it could, it could extend into every sector of society, which it did, you know, criminal justice, the economy, social tolerance. He had uh, Germans, Swedes, Jews, everybody uh, were invited into the colony, whether they believed in Quakerism or not. And the thing did not fall apart, that it was not overcome by outside forces. It only deteriorated when they lost sight of the vision. After Penn died, his uh, son was kind of a ne'er-do-well who drank up all the money and revoked a treaty that had been made with the Delaware Indians and started being, uh, you know, mis Mr. White Man <laughs> to the Delaware Indians and the thing fell apart. So I think we are justified in saying that if nonviolence is carried out correctly, it seemingly is invincible. You know, in a way, even if you lose, you win because you establish your point even in the act of being overcome. Uh, <clears throat> It, or I think it was either Augustine or Tert Tertullian. No, it was Augustine who said that the Christians prevailed not by fighting back, but by dying. So then, again, even when you lose, you win. If you're being, to the extent that you're being nonviolent. Okay, that's Western civilization. Now, <laughs> we'll take a break and talk a little bit about the Vedanta. Yeah. Um, when you were recapping some of what you talked about before, um, you were talking about like how to deal with when you have to deal with toxic individuals. Yeah. Would you? Um, is it like in in the notes or in the recording for last week, or is it something that you could develop a teeny bit more today? I think, given what Jill and I were saying about it before yeah. others arrived, I think we could develop it a little more. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask, I'm just burning. So, so after all those five movements, was there, is there any, like, you know, common, what did you learn from how they ended so that we would know how they not to not end? Or not yeah, well, I, I think there are various lessons there, and we'd have to read the history, like some of the ones in the Middle Ages and the early Renaissance, uh, they ended by being uh, overwhelmed. They were killed off. The Cathars in the south of France 
were basically destroyed. I mean, they were just, it, was a, it was a massacre. So looking back, what could uh -huh. have That's a very interesting question. Um, okay, if I were to answer it quickly, which it seems I'm about to do, what could have been done was to have offered the, the, the state and the people who were utterly panic-stricken about not having an uh, army to defend themselves, to offer them an alternative. Now, let me give you an example. That's so, as you know, what's right going on right now in Japan is the new prime minister of Japan has apparently gone pretty far toward revoking Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, which says Japanese forces will never be used overseas for aggressive purposes. And now I had discussions with several Japanese friends in Tokyo about eight or nine years ago, and I said, if you want to preserve Article 9, the, you have to add the positive dimension. Because Article 9 says we won't do A, you have to supply we will instead do B. And that's what I'm saying right now in this group called World Beyond War, that we need first, not only to add this, but we need to do it first, to develop a plausible alternative which can, by which you can defend yourself. And then say, let's, let's, de let's de deconstruct the war system. You know, the parallel here is like using construct a program before you go to a boycott. Weave our own cloth and then say to the British, we don't need your cloth. And this is even more uh, psychologically urgent, I would say. Yeah. So that's, uh, I think, <coughs> uh, they were able to develop a security system within their own culture, but not one that had the capacity to defend them against the others, the French, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, people, uh, native people living in the Ecuador jungle yeah. who were, became aware through intuition and dreaming that they were under threat, which hadn't arrived yet. And they mm -hmm. reached out for partnership. This is the, yeah. the Pachamama alliance. They reached yeah. out to white people for, yeah. uh, to, for help. Yeah, that's a very good idea. about the threat uh, yeah. that was coming and to deal with it. Yeah, that's a good example. Thank you, Lynn Twist. Yes. <laughs> okay, now should we really take a break now? I'm going to, that was the West. <laughs> so I now want to look to certain uh, threads of nonviolence uh, in ancient India. And this will serve two purposes for us. It will just kind of, you know, give us a comparative background. And it will also help us prepare for under understanding Gandhi. Gandhi. I remember being in a, uh, a restaurant in Berkeley, which is now defunct, with a couple of colleagues. And one of them announced to me very excitedly, that he had discovered where Gandhi was coming from, and it was Leibniz or Descartes or something like that. And I was so, frankly, I was angry. I was very angry that people felt that they had to give him an origin in the West because they, they, they never heard of, you know, that there could be a civilization other than ours. And I, I said to this person rather testily, I'm afraid, he said, did you ever hear of the Vedanta? And of course, he never had. Yeah. So uh, the fact is that any, any monotheistic religion will have hit upon the need for nonviolence in its own way, um, in its own implementation of it, um, for the reason that I mentioned earlier, that once you realize that there is only one common underlying reality that unites us all, then violence against another becomes uh, 
And I don't know what word to use. We, there used to be this four-letter word starting with an E that we used around here. But it becomes, um, at the very least, let's say two things. It becomes, it becomes inappropriate and counterproductive to do that. And whether we are aware of it or not, the Vedanta system of ancient India is completely monotheistic. Sometimes people in the West get thrown off by, oh, all of these gods, and each of them has four arms, so that gives you, know, like a total of so many thousand arms. I don't know if you all saw that cartoon in The New Yorker of uh, this couple standing by their back doors, backyard swimming pool, and the Shiva is appearing in the sky, and the husband is saying to the wife, it appears to be Shiva manifesting as the god of destruction, but what he's doing in Canfield, Connecticut on a Thursday night, I, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> be that as it may, the, one of the most ancient statements from the Vedic tradition is ekam sat bahuda vipra vadanti, which means the reality is one, the wise have called it by many names. Now, if, again, let's really fast forward to Gandhi uh, saying, every religion has been given by God, but it has been received by man. So every religion contains a kernel of truth, but it requires a certain pruning because we, we are fallible. So the initial impulse is infallible, but the reception is fallible. So we have to be able to thread our way to the core reality of any system. Um, it's kind of got, as you may guess, I've, you know, this has been my life for the last 40 years, so how to, you know, pick out what exactly to say. It's proving a little difficult. What are the Vedas? What are the Vedas? That's a good question. But he can read it later, actually, or Fandra, that's okay. So the Vedantic system traces its uh, source to these uh, collections of hymns known as the Vedas. And there are four of these collections, Rik, Sama, Yajur, and Atarva. And they're, they're, uh, com they are preserved in an extremely ancient form of Sanskrit, making it one of the earliest extensive writings. In fact, I think the earliest extended corpus of writing in any Indo-European language. That we have some little bit of writing from Tocharian that's actually earlier, but it, it's nothing compared to the Vedic corpus. So these are mostly hymns about the gods of nature and the power of sacrifice. And they have been preserved in, not only in their language, but in what's called their cantillation or the way of reciting them. They've been preserved for 4,000 years. So um, back in 2007, I visited an ashram in south of India, Ramana Maharshi's ashram, and there were these Brahmin boys and men that came and sat around his Mahasamadhi, the place where he, he passed away. Uh, and they, they, you would hear them all afternoon. It's incredibly powerful to listen to. You know, Agni mille purohitam yatnyasya devam urtvijam. In absolute unison, over and over again, preserved exactly the way it sounded 4,000 years earlier. It's an incredible thing that they managed to pull off because A, they didn't have computers, <laughs> and B, they didn't use writing. They eventually wrote these things down, but they didn't use the written form to preserve them. It was just handed on. You would, if you were a, a young Brahmin and you were a male and you were learning the Vedas to which your family was dedicated, you know, which, which of the hymns was dedicated, it's one of hymns collections, you would memorize them backwards and forwards, literally. Backwards and forwards. You would like go like you'd memorize a line, and then you'd pick up the first word of the next line and you know, take that many 
take five words from the previous line. It's very, very complicated systems where they made absolutely sure that this stuff would be preserved. And this is what holds their, their culture together, nominally anyway, and if you don't believe in the authority of the Vedas, you are not a Hindu. So <clears throat> there are two things, you need two things to be a Hindu, uh, and I think I have maybe half of one of them. Uh, I think the Vedas are pretty cool. Uh, but the other, the other criterion I don't make at all, and that is that you have to be born into a Hindu family. There weren't enough Hindu families in Brooklyn in 1936 when I, I decided to be born, so I miss out on that one. But uh, along with this set of hymns, which are very beautiful, not necessarily terrifically spiritual, but they have some spirituality in them, uh, there had to build up an interpretive tradition because people couldn't understand the language after a while, and they had other things in their culture that they needed to preserve. So they had another set of documents which uh, were divided in two parts. They were divided into the karma kanda, or the action part, which told you what to do, and the jnana kanda, or the knowledge part, which told you how to interpret what you were doing. And in this jnana kanda were transmitted these incredible texts called the Upanishads. And they became known as the Vedanta, or the tradition as a whole is sometimes called the Vedanta, which means the end of the Vedas. And you can interpret that, this is, this is Veda plus Anta, which is cognate with the English word end. Our language is like a distant cousin of Sanskrit, by the way. Um, and I told you that it, it's called the Vedanta for two reasons. There's a kind of boring reason that in a Vedic collection, if you're memorizing them, you, get, you do the hymns first, and then you do the Aranyakas, and then you do the Upanishads that your family is responsible for. So they come at the end of the Veda in that sense. But in a spiritual sense, they represent the culmination of Vedic wisdom. And the Upanishads, uh, the, the term, incidentally, do you have the book in front of you? Is it? Laura, let us see Upanishad. Oh, that's the Gita that you have. Okay. That's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll get it later. Uh, the Upanishads, of which we have a really good collection here, if I may say so myself, having been involved in editing them, these are like the oldest uh, source of what's sometimes called the wisdom tradition or the perennial philosophy. The oldest source. The oldest and purest in the sense that they are the least loaded onto with mythological and ritual content. Now the term Upanishad invokes a picture of, uh, well it literally means sitting up close to. So it invokes a picture of what I like to call the power moment of ancient India's civilization, which is a vulnerable student, open-hearted student, in my case actually a broken-hearted, <laughs> with heart broken open, and an, an established teacher who's able to transmit wisdom into the heart of that person. And they have a conversation. These conversations are learned, um, somehow memorized, handed on down. And some of the Upanishads will actually begin with uh, a statement like, Brahma Vido Vedanti, the, the students of wisdom ask their teacher, what is the cause of the cosmos? <clears throat> Incidentally, since you people seem to not mind when I have a literary lapse, all right, I will share one. This interesting comparison dawned on me the other day because I was thinking of that famous line from Goethe's Faust. You know, Faust ha is agonizing over these questions. And he says, you know, I've been through philosophy and theology and everything, and I cannot get down to the root causes of reality, and it's just about killing me. So he asks questions which are very similar to the questions asked by these students, real or imagined, uh, that launch an Upanishad. And look at the contrast. 
when Faust asks these questions, his soul is taken away by the devil. And when the Upanishad students ask the question, they get illumined. <laughs> Something to be learned here. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what. But in the Upanishads, among other things, there is uh, this incredible concept of dharma. I'm getting slowly better at writing in this awkward angle. And dharma comes from a root. Dr. This is a semi-vowel. And dr means to uphold. So dharma is the upholding underlying principle of the universe. And uh, anyone who does not believe in the dharma is what's called a Gnostica or a naysayer. And remember when a Mephistopheles appears in Goethe's Faust? I don't know why I keep coming back to this play. And, and Faust says, aha, so that's what was in the dog all along. With, with apologies to fancy, Faust asks him, who are you? He just says, ich bin der Reis der Stets verneint. I am the spirit of denial. Nastika. No, uh, in it's the way we would just transliterate it is N A S long A S because what they're saying is N Asti. It isn't. It isn't. N Asti becomes Nastika, which rhymes with nasty, but that's a coincidence. So uh, everything is upheld by Dharma, and not to believe in Dharma is to disbelieve in the order of the universe and to put yourself at the mercy of random forces. So, okay, what is the Dharma? What can we say about it? Um, get, can you pick up the bottom of the thing? Okay. There is a phrase that you come across again and again, especially in the, uh, in the great epic, Okay, I hope you can read that. Ahimsa paramo dharma, which means nonviolence. Or, you know, we've talked about what ahimsa actually means the overcoming or the conversion of any desire to injure. Whatever that is, ahimsa. Parama means supreme, the ultimate. So, ahimsa is the ultimate dharma. It is the upholding principle of the universe, and this was articulated in India long before it even starts to surface as an idea, much less a word in the West. So eventually you realize there was an incredible civilization going on in India. I realized it one day in New York when I was in a classroom. A friend of mine was a music major, and I went to uh, I visited his class, and it was just a little room, even smaller than this, and the, they had a guest performer that day, and the guest performer was Ravi Shankar. So, like, I was sitting about as far as I would, even closer, actually, more like to where I am with, and Laura, listening to Ravi Shankar live for an hour and a half. And I came out, and I said, holy cow. Well, I said something else, actually, but that was New York in those days. Uh, and, you know, these people had an incredible civilization, and I had no idea. Um, so the ultimate underlying principle of the universe, and this is formulated a long, long time ago, is non-injury. Or what happens, literally, the word ahimsa means what happens when every desire to injure, be it physically socially, in terms of structural violence, mentally, whatever, has been resisted and ultimately overcome and converted into its positive alternative. Now, I know I'm saying a lot, actually, hold on, thank you for not pointing it out. This, this is a <laughs> uh, uh, 
I'm saying a lot about this one word, but I believe it's legit. I believe that, that uh, w it was condensed into that word because one thing that uh, India had going for it was continuity. So they were able to you know, rework and rework and formulate and condense. And you've heard of sutras. Sutras are f condensed formulas which are like E equals MC squared. So this is a formula about reality, which is as, has as much explanatory power as E equals MC squared does. But E equals MC squared is about the external world. This is about the internal world. So in the Upanishads, there is, of course, reference every now and then to Dharma. And one of them that has impressed me very much is a phrase that says, by means of Dharma, even a beggar can overcome a king. So that is uh, nonviolence in a nutshell, right? This is, you know, an insurrectionary movement will succeed against the most, even the greatest military power if it is true to the underlying principle of reality. And to have that embodied, made into a formula in a text thousands of years ago is, is you know, it's, it's impressive to say the very least. So, yes, Monica? What's the relation between the underlying reality, I believe it's called Brahman, and Ahimsa? And uh -huh. How is the relation? Are they the same thing or are they different things? So you're asking, what is the relation between the underlying principle of reality and ahimsa? Yes. Uh, when we act nonviolently, we are making ourselves an instrument of the underlying principle. When we act violently, we are contradicting it. Does that help? I mean, so okay. Ahim, I'm sorry. go ahead. So Ahimsa, if Brahman is everything, then Ahimsa is part of it? Or okay, I think I see what's happening here. <laughs> uh, it's, it's very difficult to boil everything down to one formula that will work in all circumstances. So this is a formula that works about as well as any from a particular point of view. But to say that ahimsa is Brahman, I don't think has ever been said. I've never seen it. It's just a different outlook, a different model. And I guess I would say don't worry about it for now. That, you know, Brahman is one way of naming the totality and ahimsa is another. Uh, and uh, equating ahimsa with the underlying dharma is another way of, of naming the supreme reality. Yeah, Laura. If, um, if, it's, uh, if it's true that a small amount of good can overcome uh, a lot of confusion, right, or negativity or destruction, um, because it's in harmony with this law uh -huh. of nature, does yeah. that then also mean that when violence happens, it's using massive amounts of energy in order to, to interesting. And it's it? interesting. I think there is a serious truth to that in the sense that violence is incredibly inefficient. How much money have we spent uh, getting nowhere in Iraq? Two trillion dollars? Uh, what is, it was calculated by a theologian friend of mine, uh, um, John Howard Yoder, back in the early days when we were just starting what has become Nonviolent Peace Force and PBI and all of these interventionary groups. He calculated how much money would it take to convert the world to a nonviolent peace force and indexed to the military budget, 0.3%, 0.3%. Mm 
0.3% of the military budget would give us an incredible worldwide peace force, able to stop any conflict. And that was actually a measure of what you're saying right now, that violence has to invoke a huge amount of energy to accomplish very little in the short term. Whereas nonviolence on a little bit of energy can make a tremendous change that's lasting. Uh -huh. And that's also true, yeah, as Stephanie is pointing out, that what, w the way we experience it is as a conservation of energy that's trying to be wasted. Um, and a conservation of energy such that our internal energy, our prana, as it is called in Sanskrit, is harmonic, harmonic with the cosmic energy at a very deep level, which means two things. It means you may not see it. Because the harmonic, the, 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 the cosmic energy is very, very concealed from our vision, but also means that, that it, it, there's an incredible power that we're tapping into. I mean, if, if you want to really put it in the starkest possible terms, one little person weighing like 105 pounds without teeth. <laughs> was able to overcome the greatest empire the world had ever seen. Why? Because the empire was using the wrong kind of power, which not, was denying, no one's denying that it exists, but it's tremendously inefficient. And not only that, but after uh, India achieved independence, it's been calculated that about 50 countries were able to decolonize just as a result of that example. Most of them in Africa, actually. There's a lot of Africans who were recruited to fight in the British Army. And Indians said to them, what are you doing up here? And they said, we're helping to keep the British free. And the Indians said, why don't you get free yourself? <laughs> so, so that caught on. And after the decolonization, that's what happened. Now, they didn't always carry it out in a nonviolent way, which would have meant much more enduring results. Well, now, so this is, and so we want to get from that invisible, inviolable principle to the world that we live in, which is very visible <laughs> and partly visible. Um, they had a very, uh, pretty well articulated scheme for working out how our daily experience is remotely, remotely connectable to the uh, ultimate dharma. And so, okay, we live in a world of space-time. And now in space, in social space, they uh, propose that every group, as long as it is recognizable as a group, has a dharma. And when you break it down every, a little bit further, every individual has his or her own dharma. And that is called our sva dharma, our own dharma. And uh, the purpose of life, well, let me just sh kind of shorthand it there. Oops, <laughs> it's very hard to write backwards for me anyway. Okay. Hope you can make that out. That's SVA, which uh, is the word for one's own. So each of us has a dharma, which is our own dharma. And that feels pretty good that we have this meaning. This gives us our meaning, our purpose in life. And uh, Ishran, in a, in a tape that we saw a few nights ago, we quoted from somebody who's saying, if you look good enough, you don't need a purpose in your life. <laughs> but <laughs> but it turns out that most of us do need a purpose in our life. We're should probably be saying something about our looks. I'm not sure. <laughs> but be that as it may, 
each of us has his or her own svadharma, and the, the goal of life is to discover what is our dharma and carry it out. That's, that's what we have to do as embodied beings. Yeah, Monica? Is it different for each of us? Well, okay, in order to formulate that correctly, I think we need to have a model in our mind of unity in diversity so that there will be a uniqueness about each dharma, each sila dharma will be unique. See, my dharma is not to raise Adam. It, it, yours is. So on that level, we have a, uni a different dharma. But underneath that, you're doing this for a positive, constructive purpose. And everything that I do, if it's part of my svadharma, is also done for a purpose. But there would not be a Michael Nagler over here and a Monika Nenko over there if they were not two svadharmas. It is dharma that actually is um, embodied, rein, uh, reincarnated uh, in each incarnation. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure what I meant by that, but I still stand by that fuzzy remark. Uh, okay, if we think of ourselves as, um, as Americans, we, there's a dharma that this polity has. We came here for a purpose, and we exist for a purpose. And I remember Bono, when he was interviewed by uh, Oprah, you didn't think I'd be talking about them today, did you? <laughs> uh, Bono said, America is not a country you know, it's an idea. And uh, she broke down hearing that. Cause, you know. And then you can see how very far we are from having understood, carried out our dharma. I mean, frankly, we may have to edit this part out, <laughs> but frankly, I think what we're doing to democracy is what the Russians did to communism. We're, we're basically ruining it as a concept. But that isn't what we're all here to talk about today. So, so uh, when uh, Buddhists say the dharmas are innumerable, I vow to master them, it means by being absolutely correct in my own svadharma, I will be resonating with the dharma of every group and not be in conflict with them. Mm. Ain't that nice? Yeah. So that uh, when we say in nonviolence, part of our belief system is that there is no irreducible underlying conflict. Period. If you feel that you're in conflict with another person, especially to the extent that you feel that they have to go down for you to be fulfilled, you have misunderstood something. You were saying um, before everyone got here uh -huh. about um, the idea of holding truth, uh -huh. and that if you find that there are two sets of truths, yeah. in some way they have to reconcile. Yes, this is what Stephanie is saying is very NVC. Uh, it is if, if I find, like, say, I have a truth and Laura has a truth and not the same, to the extent that they really are truth, they will be reconcilable. And our job is to reconcile them. So that every interaction, instead of being a fight, becomes a learning process. And that is known as nonviolence. So, so as far as social space is concerned, there is a primary dharma, which is the same everywhere for every, uh, ex every entity, every sentient being, as Buddhists like to say. And there's a special implementation of that dharma for each group. And there's a special implementation of it for each individual in that group. Similarly, in terms of time, this dharma is eternal and unvarying. There was never a period of time when the Dharma became uh, mutual slaughter. You know, 
It, it's always ahimsa. But in every age, it has to be implemented in a particular way, in a characteristic way, characteristic of that age. And that is called the yuga dharma, the yuga of the age. And now here's where it gets really interesting. Uh, the ancient seers, and I'm not even calling them Hindus because we were not yet to the, the formation of the classical Hindu religion, but the ancient sages believed in a quantum theory of time. They believed that time was not a continuous stream. It was divided into what they call churnum, or an instant. And every instant that we're alive has its given dharma. And that was called by a very colorful term, a nimisha dharma. Nimisha means an eye blink. So one state arises and falls. Blink, another state rises and falls. So this is what uh, becomes chanakavada in, in Buddhism. And at every moment of our existence, there is a there is a dharma which is characteristic of that moment. What are, are the yuga dharma, as a lot of people believe, is uh, truth. That the dharma of this age that we're living through is truth, because so much of what we're seeing is characterized by untruth. Well, it means the way to overcome untruth is by asserting truth. So, as the Buddha says, um, we must overcome unkindness through kindness, uh, greed through generosity, and untruth by truth. It's similar to what we were saying before, Jill, about why these waves didn't succeed. is primarily because they had not yet articulated their truth in a way that was visible to the others. Yeah. How long constitutes a dharma, um, a yuga? Well, uh, as to how long a yuga is, is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. uh, there was actually a pretty precise system. As you know, the Indians were pretty mathematical. That's why we have this uh, Ramanujan, who was the greatest theoretician of numbers that, that ever lived, and and Chandra Shaker in astronomy and all these people, uh, they were pretty mathematical, and uh, I am not. <laughs> but they, they actually allowed you to calculate how long a yuga was, and they, they, they added them all up and came up with the age of the universe as being about 15 billion years, which is incredibly close <laughs> to what we have come up with. And we had this incredible yay boo experience when uh, what was the fellow who did that s series called Cosmos before Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan. He said they came up with a, a very good prediction of the age of the universe. We were all sitting around watching this on television, and the whole ashram says yay. <laughs> and then he said, of course, this was by pure chance. We said boo. <laughs> So others arrive at the truth by chance. We arrive at it by knowledge. That's colonialism in the scientific world. So um, within the civilization that eventually became the, they call it, orthodox system of Hinduism, which accepts the Vedas, and the heterodox systems which do not, namely Jainism and Buddhism, there was a deeply imbued in them a nonviolent culture, and it was incorporated in, you know, in story and song. And in our uh, retreat at Mount Madonna Center, I talked about my favorite uh, Jataka story. A Jataka story is a story about previous births of the Buddha, okay, who he was before he was incarnated as Buddha. And incidentally, not accepting reincarnation was about the worst mistake that the West ever made. 
I, you know, I'll explain why I say that. But the only reason they did it was to show that they were not Greeks or Jews. And uh, I'm sure they had some value in showing that, but it was a huge mistake because now, okay, don't get me started. Back to the Jataka stories. So the Buddha had Buddha nature before he became the Buddha, and it showed up as he went through the cycles of evolution. And at one point in these cycles, he was the king of a, of a colony of deer. This is called the Deer King Jataka. And uh, I won't embarrass uh, my friends who were at the retreat to, and ask them to see how much, how well they remember the story, but I will, I will spare you the embarrassment as a form of ahimsa uh, by telling a story. Besides, I love the story. Uh, there was a king, a human king, who, had a, who was addicted to venison, and every day he would take his courtiers out and they would kill a lot of deer and bring them back and feast on them. And the deer population was going to be obliterated. And so they told the king, this isn't going to help you any, and it's not going to help us any. And I just realized, after you know telling the story for years, I suddenly realized this is an environmental story. That, you know, if you consume all the resources, how is it going to help you? That's incredible. Anyway, they made a deal with him. They say, okay, you're addicted to venison. We're not going to try and cure you. We don't know how to do that. But every day, one of us will come to the royal kitchen and lay his or head, her head on the block. You'll have your venison and we won't be wiped out. So instead of clear cutting, let's do you know, scientific trimming of the deer population. So the king agrees, and one day uh, the, deer, the king of the deer is walking through the forest and he, he comes upon a doe who is weeping piteously and says to her, what is, what's the trouble? And she says, well, today is my turn. And he says, that's really too bad. And she says, I'm not crying for myself, I'm crying for my little fawn. And you know, when I die, my unborn child will die. And this awakens the compassion, which isn't too hard to do, of the compassionate one. And he says, don't worry, you don't have to go. And he then goes by himself as a substitute and puts his head on the block in the back of the kitchen and the, the royal butcher comes out and he sees the king of the deer and he can't do this because, you know, you do not kill a king. Regicide. Uh, unless you're in a Shakespeare play. <laughs> so he goes in and says to the king, I'm sorry, your majesty, we have a problem. And he takes him out and shows him that the deer king is lying there. And the king, the human king says, okay, okay, you've made your point. Uh, I won't kill you. I'll do without venison today. Fully expecting that the gods will say, sadhu, sadhu, you know, good, good. And rain petals down on him and the deer king will get up and go away. And he'll have to do without venison for one day, and that'll be, that'll be the end of it. The king doesn't get up. So he says to him, you know, I've given you what you want. What is your problem? And the dear king says, I'm not getting up until you promise that you won't kill us anymore. And this is very hard. I mean, he's got, you know, like, like a crack cocaine addiction to venison. But what can he do? He's in a complete quandary. He cannot kill a king, and he cannot leave him lying there on the block. So he, can, he, you know, he goes through this conversion, and he says, all right, I won't kill any more deer. And guess what? The, the deer king still doesn't get up. And so in utter exasperation, the human king says, what do you want? <laughs> And he, the deer king says, promise me that you will not kill any animals ever again. The human king realized that he has been had. And so he says, all right, I promise. And then <laughs> the, the deer king springs up and runs back into the forest. So, but I, you know, several things I love about the story. I hadn't even realized the environment part until today. Um, but it's such a perfect 
narrative form of the power of nonviolence. Because with the ability to sacrifice comes a tremendous power over the other. And the more you're willing to sacrifice, the more you're willing to get from the other party. So this is a real stage three, or the, the Deer King decided to interpret it as a stage three conflict in which in order to get what he wanted, he had to be really, really willing to risk his life. Um, I had another example that just flashed through my mind, but this has been a long session already, and I think it's kind of disappeared. It'll, it'll come back. Um, now, uh, so we are going to see this played out time and time again in Gandhi's career, which we're leading up to, that he he knew that he had a power over others that he could invoke by being willing to sacrifice. Uh, because that willingness states that you and I are deeply interfused, interconnected. It is not the case that by, by making you suffer, I will succeed. I will prevail. Okay. Anything else at this point before I barrel on? Anything from? Yeah, well, we were discussing the, um, we got stuck on the idea of the national dharma. Ah. And um, there were some suggestions as to what that could be. And um, such as mm -hmm. basically helping to show Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that um, also came up was the idea that the national dharma could be to realize one nation, this mm -hmm. kind of false kind of imaginary community with other imaginary communities that call themselves nations, mm -hmm. realize its unity with uh, them, and it, that brings it into this oceanic circle idea. Yeah. Well, there's several things that uh, you brought up there, or whoever brought it up there. Let's start with the back end, because you mentioned the Iliad, and that's what Homer always used to do. You ask him a series of questions. He would start with the last one and work back to the beginning. Uh, this oceanic circle was, and it, it really fits into what we were saying earlier about organization. If you're not going to organize the world at the microscopic level, the biggest level, as a hierarchy, where there's one, uh, what did we used to call ourselves recently? Un, the what? We are the indispensable nation. Yeah. In other words, we are the only nation that you cannot do without. You can do without all the rest. Uh, if you're not going to adopt that model, then uh, what other kind of world order model is appropriate and nonviolent? So he had this scheme where instead of looking at all the nations and asking himself, how are they to be organized, which is a very kind of the way we were always approaching it here in the West. And in, in the 60s and 70s, I tried to participate in something called the World Order Modeling Project, or WAMP. And when I went to WAMP offices, they had these big diagram world maps, and all the nation states were, you know, kind of connected by lines and stuff. So you accept the existence of the nation state, was a, which is a mystique to begin with, and a mistake to begin with, and you start at the highest level. He did the exact opposite, start from the individual. He said the individual, it, well, he had various ways of doing this. The most extreme form was the individual willing to sacrifice himself for the good of the family in this ideal order. The fa No, no, Gandhi, Gandhi, yeah. Well, what the only thing the Iliad had to do with it is that I'm answering as best I can your last question before I go on to the person. Okay, sorry. 
sometimes these ridiculous jokes backfire. That's right. Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> okay. Um, where was I? So okay. <laughs> so the. This is Gandhi's vision of how the entire world should be organized. Okay, so it fits in very beautifully with what we were saying before. If you had a nonviolent world order instead of a violent one, where the ultimate sanction is not force but love, what would it look like? And here's how it would look. The individual, each individual is willing to sacrifice himself for the family which immediately makes a hell of a lot more sense in India or at parts of Africa than it does uh, in the West. The sacrifice, the India, blah, blah, blah. The family is willing to sacrifice itself for the village, which again makes more sense in India than in the US where we don't have villages anymore. Except, you know, we're gonna make Petaluma into a village at the end of the month. The village is willing to sacrifice itself for the district the district for the state, you know, be it Uttar Pradesh or Kerala, or uh, it, most African countries are organized in states also, South Sudan being one. And the state is willing to sacrifice itself for the nation. And now this is the key point that you have to have where the whole system falls apart. The nation is willing to sacrifice itself for the world, the commonwealth of the world. So that takes you to what he called an oceanic circle, that name coming from the Greek myth of Okeanos, or a kind of mythical ocean that surrounded the world, which unlike a, hier <coughs> a hierarchical pyramid, it elicits the contribution of the individual rather than sacrificing it to the good of the whole. So you never have a situation which, in which a has to sacrifice B because B has already willingly sacrificed him or herself in an appropriate way such that his or her best contribution can be offered into the whole. So that is the oceanic circle part of the model. Yeah, Brian, part of your question. What was the other part? Okay, good, I'm off that hook. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So uh, we've got uh, a few minutes left. Uh, sum up the entirety of Vedic civilization. Uh, uh, in the so called heterodox streams of Jainism and Buddhism, in a way, nonviolence is interpreted even more strictly especially among the Jains. I don't know if you're familiar with this religion, this community. They don't accept the, the Vedas as the bedrock of their civilization, which makes them non-Hindu for as far as that goes. And they interpret Ahimsa as an absolute prohibition of violence, of harming. So they carry this out to a spectacular degree. And Jain monks will go around wearing masks, not because they're afraid of SARS, but because they don't want to inhale any bugs. They, every t before they sit down, they have a little broom where they sweep away the seats so they don't sit on any little creatures. Needless to say, they're totally vegetarian. Um, and, and like that. And I hope I can say this without being prejudicial, but I feel that in a way they have picked up the prohibitive part of Ahimsa more uh, completely than the positive part. So yes, Ahimsa tells you do not injure but it tells you that by way of saying that when you forsake the capacity or even the desire to injure, you are engaging a deeper force, which uh, 
Muktananda, in our quote from the beginning, said was the binding force among all creatures. So I will do not, I will not do anything that can drive creatures apart is in a way the, the mantra of Jainism. And I will only act out of the awareness of unity is in a way the mantra of the positive implementation of nonviolence. Now, I don't mean to prioritize these. I think if you carry out ahimsa, even as a prohibitive force, if you carry it out completely, you will get to the other force. You know, because once you have obliterated, controlled, whatever, the last vestige of your desire to harm, what will take its place? It will be the desire to help, to support, which is what we spoke about in terms of that 1952 experiment by Joel Davids. Oh, yes, this is a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the area of the part of India where Gandhi grew up, uh, Gujarat state, it was, uh, there were a lot of Jains. And his family was very open, which is l not unlike a lot of, quote, Hindu families, unquote. They don't interpret Hinduism in an exclusive way. So they had other faiths come through and explain what they believe. And so he would have heard from quite a few Jains. And actually, there was a person that he almost was able to accept as his guru. His name was uh, Raj Kumar, I think. And he was a jeweler in Mumbai. These things happen, you know, they, you can, you can, they can come anywhere. And this was an incredibly wise person that he was a poet, actually. Gandhi was very influenced by him. But he said, in the last analysis, I could not enshrine him in my heart as my guru, as my spiritual teacher, but closer than almost anyone, right? There wasn't anyone that he said, this is my guru. Uh, and then that person was a Jain. Okay. So the reason that, uh, I mean, I'm kind of jumping a around a little bit, but the reason that uh, in higher caste Hindu families, vegetarianism is very commonly practiced is that they are interpreting ahimsa in that way. So like every religion, there is a component of nonviolence that you inherit practically at your mother's knee without being aware of it. And there is sort of a, if, if you wanted to chart a, a matter of degree, I would say Jainism is the most nonviolent system that I ever heard of, and possibly others like Islam are rather less so, but everything else is kind of in between. Did I just ruin something? The cord? Oh, a coin. Oh, well, what are they worth, you know? I'll get them later. So, for next week, uh, like this week, next week will feature Homemade uh, chai, for those of us who are here. And we sort of divide it into two parts because Gandhi's career falls into two parts. There's a uh, South Africa part, which is kind of a rehearsal, and then the, uh, the India part. And I've recommended this very large uh, biography by Rajmohan Gandhi as about the best and most sensitive biography of Gandhi, certainly the most complete and one of the most sensitive in terms of understanding Gandhi's motivation, because Gandhi was, after all, his grandfather. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't have time to read it, and it's about 700 pages, there is one by B.R. Nanda. These are all in our resource list called Mahatma, and that even has an abridged version, and that's very good. And for insight into Gandhi's spirituality, without which you cannot understand the man at all, I recommend Gandhi the Man by uh, Eknath Ishwaran. And it would not be harmful to see Attenborough's film, especially since Attenborough has you know, recently joined his ancestors. 
And we will be showing it as part of our week of nonviolence awareness. Yeah, so that'll be on the schedule. Now, to really get the most out of that film, you need about a 10-minute talk by somebody who's really quite familiar with Gandhi. And I have volunteered to try and fill in that role. So when we show it here, I will be doing that. But it's interesting, uh, I was taken to a, an institution in Berlin, which was like a real nonviolence institute there. And there's a famous Gandhi scholar and the what they what we decided to discuss there were about five of us there was was Attenborough's film and what was missing and what could have been done better so from our point of view. But the the trade off was if uh, Sir Richard Attenborough had done everything I wanted him to do, the film would have been a box office flop, and he had sunk about twenty five million into it. So he was not willing to, not about to listen to me. And, yeah, that's right, that's right, yeah. That's true, that's true. <laughs> yes, that's right, yeah. Now, there is such a film, incidentally, it's, uh, it's called Mahatma, and it was put together by the government of India, and it's 13 hours long. And it has all the footage put together in a very inspiring narrative format. In fact, we saw that at the ashram. And that was the film that kind of started and made me where I am today. That's why I am what I'm doing. Because it, it, it seemed to me that this was the greatest story ever told, retold in the 20th century. Yeah. Okay, so we're in for really an inspiring uh, next week. And it's, uh, I'm going to try to pick out highlights of his career, which, when put together, give us an overview of the power of nonviolence, not who he had to become in order to unleash that power and what that power actually is, how it works, and how we can use that. Okay, so if I do think of other resources for us, they will be on the uh, our workbook. And of course, the one thing I forgot to mention today is how Gandhi was deeply influenced by the Bhagavad Gita. So this uh, this edition of the Gita is the one that I would recommend. And it's not just because he was my teacher, but because this is the best-selling English translation of the Gita in the world. Yeah. And the Upanishads is not only the best-selling English translation, uh, but it outsells all the others put together. And the Dhammapada is the best-selling, even though his translation. his translation, even though he was not a Buddhist, quote-unquote. Yeah. So he really, he had a genius for taking these ancient texts and rendering them into a useful modern form. And I, in our resource packet, I think I have about six chapters from the Gita that I think if you don't have time to read the whole thing, read them.